Greetings, motherfuckers. My name is Sam, and today I'm going to be taking you on a perilous yet thrilling adventure through the foreboding jungle of knowledge in search of the lost fact of Indiana Jones. It's going to be a dangerous journey, folks, but luckily I brought with me my trusty bull whip, a spiffy felt hat, and a multi pack of Watsits to get us going. We're going to uncover the truth about Jones and his many exciting cinematic jaunts that have entertained moviegoers for decades, and maybe, just maybe, even learn something along the way. Hopefully 101 somethings, now that I mention it. But, which mustachioed actor was originally going to appear in the lead role? Did one of Indy's adversaries really eat a fly? And how do you safely crack a whip? I just can't get it to- Oh, gee, oh my god, that's gonna leave a mark right on the tip of- Two out of three of those questions are gonna be answered, so sit back, relax, try not to get decapitated by a booby trap that for some reason remains operational after hundreds of years of lying dormant in a spooky temple, as we count through 101 facts about Indiana Jones. Number one. Indiana Jones is an American media franchise based on the adventures of Dr. Henry Walton Indiana Jones Jr., a fictional professor of archaeology with a real mouthful of a name. Mercifully, the general convention is to shorten that to simply Indiana Jones, which rolls off the tongue far better. The series was created by movie legend George Lucas, and its films are directed by movie legend Steven Spielberg and star movie legend Harrison Ford as the title character. Number two. Oh. The year is 1977, and George Lucas and Steven Spielberg are on holiday together in Hawaii, building sandcastles like best buddies do. Lucas is there to escape the hubbub surrounding tremendous success of his outer space masterpiece, Star Wars, while Spielberg was there taking a break from filming Close Encounters of the Third Kind. At some point, while constructing elaborate piles of sand together, Spielberg expressed an interest in directing a James Bond-like film, prompting Lucas to reveal he'd been working on such a movie, following a character called Indiana Smith. Yeah, bear with us. Number three. That's right, the original name of the character that Lucas had created as the lead of his franchise was Indiana Smith. However, Spielberg wasn't a fan of the super common surname and convinced Lucas to change it to the slightly less but still very common surname of Jones. Number four. Lucas got the name Indiana from that of his pet dog, an Alaskan Malamute who, incidentally, also inspired the Star Wars character Chewbacca, owing to its habit of sitting next to him while he was riding and riding in the passenger seat while he was driving, like a good dog. Number five. The film was inspired by the action serials of the 1930s and 40s, which generally consisted of a series of short films exhibited weekly in consecutive order. Examples include the myriad of adventures of popular characters like Flash Gordon, Buck Rogers, and Tarzan, and often involved feats of heroism and daring do, which took place in the classic 1930s settings. Number six. Raiders of the Lost Ark was originally planned to be a fairly low budget movie, evidenced by the fact that the original script for the film was handwritten. Pencil and paper? What is this, the late 70s? Oh yeah, it was. It was the late 70s. Number seven. Though the critical and commercial success of Raiders of the Lost Ark is now widely known, the film was initially rejected by practically every major Hollywood studio, primarily as a result of its intended budget of $20 million, and because the deal that Lucas proposed gave him licensing and sequel rights. Eventually, the filmmakers managed to work out a deal with Paramount to finance the film, and the production on the very first Indiana Jones movie began. Number eight. A number of other actors were considered for the role of Indiana Jones before Harrison Ford managed to fight everyone else off, including Nick Nolte, Steve Martin, Bill Murray, Chevy Chase, and Jack Nicholson. Principal among the wannabe indies was Tom Selleck, whom Spielberg originally picked for the role but was prevented from signing onto the film due to existing commitments to Magnum P.I. Harrison Ford was eventually cast less than three weeks before principal photography began, apparently as a last resort, as Lucas was doubtful he would agree to do a three-picture deal. Spoiler alert though, he did! Number 9. The hat that Jones wears in the film came from the famous Herbert Johnson hat shop in London, though there are conflicting reports as to whether the specific hat was the firm's poet or Australian range. Aluru. The boots that Jones wears in Raiders of the Lost Ark are model 405 work boots made by the Alden Shoe Company of Middleborough, Massachusetts. As a result, the shoes are now advertised and sold as indie boots to this day. Number 10. Costume designer Deborah Nadulman revealed that she and Ford grabbed, twisted, and even sat on Indy's trademark hat to give it a very lived-in and well-loved aesthetic. Similarly, the battered leather jacket that Jones wears in the film was actually brand new, and had to be artificially aged by the costume department to make it look like it was owned by a rugged globe-trotting adventurer rather than a fashion-forward academic. Number 11. <laughs> Early concept art for the character who ultimately became the sadistic Gestapo agent Major Arnold Tott originally depicted him as a uniformed Nazi officer, equipped with a mechanical arm that doubled as a machine gun, a bionic eye, and a radio antenna built into his head. Sadly, Lucas eventually dismissed this version of Tott as being too far-fetched, which is hilarious coming from the guy who made Star Wars. Number 12. 
The opening sequence of Raiders of the Lost Ark sees Jones accompanied by a pair of ultimately treacherous Peruvian guides known as Satipo and Barranca. Somewhat interestingly, Satipo and Barranca are actually named after two small towns located in Peru. Number 13. After opening up a can of whip ass on Barranca, Jones is followed into a booby trap temple in Peru by Satipo, who is played by Alfred Molina in one of his very first major credited roles. His first scene on his first day of filming required him to be covered with live tarantulas, which obviously is the best way to begin a long career in TV and film. Number 14. One of the most famous scenes in the entire Indiana Jones series appears towards the end of the film's opening sequence, when Jones is chased out of the previously mentioned booby trap temple in Peru by an enormous spherical boulder. This massive 7 meter wide prop was actually made of fiberglass, making the filming of the scene only kind of dangerous rather than, you know, incredibly dangerous. Number 15. Sound designer Ben Burt has stated that in order to get convincing sound effects for the huge rolling boulder, he and his team tried pushing boulders down a hill, but this tactic did not produce the desired noise. Later on, Burt realized they could get a decent sound effect by recording the noise made by a car rolling down a gravel driveway, which can be heard in the actual movie. Wow, 20 million dollars doesn't stretch as far as you think. Number 16. Impressively, Harrison Ford was actually running in front of the boulder in the opening sequence, rather than having a trained and crucially expendable stuntman to do it instead. Because the scene was shot twice from five different angles, Ford had to outrun the boulder a total of 10 times. Spielberg later opined quite cheerfully that he was an idiot for letting Ford do the stunt. Number 17. After Jones manages to outrun the huge boulder booby trap, he is immediately met with a tribe of hostile natives, who chase him as he makes his escape. As he frantically runs away from his pursuers, Jones famously yells at his pilot, Jock Lindsay, to start the engine to his seaplane. When he does, the sound produced is the same one used in Star Wars when the Millennium Falcon's hyperdrive engine fails. Number 18. Speaking of which, by the way, the registration letters of OBCPO that are emblazoned on the side of Jock's seaplane constitute another nice little callback to Star Wars. OB is short for Obi-Wan Kenobi and CPO for C-3PO. Number 19. The Egyptian capital of Cairo was actually represented on screen by the Tunisian city of Kerwam. Filming in Tunisia was apparently a miserable experience, owing to both the intense heat and the fact that at one point pretty much every single member of the cast and crew got food poisoning. Yep, it's not all glitz and glamour, sometimes it's throwing up in a port in the middle of the desert. Number 20. Smarty Pants director Steven Spielberg managed to avoid getting sick by eating only from his supply of tinned food and bottled water that he bought from Sainsbury's in England. So basically, Britain saved Indiana Jones? Yep, let's go with that. We need a morale boost right now. Number 21. To give you an idea of exactly how badly everyone was stricken with the onset sickness, at one point in filming, John Reese davis was required to bend over during his performance as Sala, an old friend of Jones who assists him in his search for the Ark. Owing to the fact that he was ludicrously unwell at the time, the simple act of bending over was enough to force Reese davis to soil himself. The scene they were filming didn't even appear in the final movie either. Gutted. Number 22. <laughs> Still, the aforementioned production-wide food poisoning may actually have been responsible for one of the most iconic moments in the film. The famous scene in which Jones nonchalantly shoots a menacing swordsman was not actually in the original script, which was going to have the world's most badass archaeologist use his whip to disarm the attacker. However, Ford's case of food poisoning was so severe he was unable to perform the stunt, and after several unsuccessful tries, he suggested that Jones should simply shoot his character's sword-wielding assailant. Spielberg agreed, and the rest is film history. Number 23. For the scene in which Jones ascends into the snake-filled well of souls, Ben Burt created the noise of thousands of scaly boys slithering around in an underground chamber by coupling the sound of him sticking his fingers into a cheese casserole made by his wife with the sound of dragging wet sponges across the grip tape on a skateboard. I can't imagine that either of those would sound like a pit of snakes, but what do I know? I'm just a disembodied internet voice screaming into the void. Number 24. In order to film the Well of Souls sequence, 3,000 snakes were brought in to cover the floor of the chamber. Upon doing so, though, the production team realized that somehow 3,000 snakes wasn't even close to being enough to completely coat the chamber floor as the script demanded, requiring an additional 7,000 serpents to be brought in for a total of 10,000 note ropes. Number 25. Except, technically, many of these snakes in the Well of Souls are not actually snakes at all, but were in fact legless lizards, which, being non-venomous, were completely harmless to the cast and crew. Legless lizards are recognisable by their ear holes and eyelids, both of which snakes lack, because snakes are simply too cool for ear holes and eyelids. Sorry lizards, I don't make the rules, baby. Number 26. Inside the Well of Souls, there is a golden pillar decorated with hieroglyphics, which also features a tiny engraving of R2-D2 and C-3PO from the Star Wars saga. 
The beloved robot duo can be spotted on the wall behind Jones, which appears to depict Princess Leia uploading the plans to the Death Star into R2-D2, with C-3PO standing beside them. Number 27. The submarine model used for the German U-boat in the film was the very same model being used by the production of Wolfgang Peterson's 1981 submarine film Das Boot. Due to a breakdown in communication, the crew working on Das Boot were not initially aware that the model was being used on Raiders of the Lost Ark, leading to them turning up one morning to find their submarine missing. Oh, I hate it when that happens. I can't tell you how many times I've misplaced my submarine. <laughs> well, I, I can actually, it's, it's four. Number 28. Renowned British wrestler and actor Pat Roach actually plays two roles in Raiders of the Lost Ark, portraying both a Sherpa and a large German mechanic. Sadly, both of these characters die in the film, the Sherpa is left in a burning Nepalese bar, and the burly German gets ripped to shreds while fighting against Jones, who is physically weaker but far more vigilant of the dangers posed by spinning plane propellers. You should watch out for them, gang. Number 29. The makers of Raiders of the Lost Ark didn't want the blood effects from gunshots to be too gratuitous, and so opted to use fine red dust instead of liquid fake blood. So when Indy's lady companion Marion ruthlessly mows down a truck full of bad guys just prior to Mr. Muscly Mechanic Man getting sliced to smithereens, the red mist that explodes from the squibs worn by the actors was actually Pepper, which immediately blew over the set and engulfed the cast and crew in one massive collecting coughing and crying fit. This film sounds cursed. Number 30. There is a well-known moment in the film when Jones threatens to blow up the Ark with a rocket launcher, which I understand is an integral part of archaeological best practice. At the moment when Indy's rival Belloc quips that Jones is going to give mercenaries a bad name, a small fly appears to land on his face and crawl onto his mouth, which, rather shockingly, Belloc doesn't react to, like, at all. In reality, the fly did actually fly away as Freeman was delivering the line, but Spielberg thought it would be funny to cut out a couple of frames to give the impression that Belloc just straight up ate a fly. Number 31. To produce the sound of the heavy lid of the Ark being slid open, the ever-resourceful Ben Burt literally recorded himself moving the lid of his toilet cistern at home. You can recreate that sound effect right now. Not right now, don't do it while you're watching us, that's disrespectful, but later on when you need the toilet, go for it, love. Uh, mate. Uh, oh god. Number 32. The spirit effect seen at the climax of the film when the hubristic douchebag has opened the Ark of the Covenant was created by filming mannequins underwater in slow motion through a fuzzy lens, giving the figures a spooky and ethereal quality. Bert once again opted for a lo-fi solution for sound effects, creating the sounds that are heard after the Ark was opened by putting the cries of dolphins and sea lions through a vocoder. Number 33. Given that several of his previous films, such as Jaws and 1941, had run significantly over schedule and over budget, Spielberg was eager to prove that he could be a responsible filmmaker, capable of weaving his cinematic magic without angering studio execs in the process. Thankfully, Raiders of the Lost Ark was eventually delivered ahead of schedule and within budget. You go, Steve. Number 34. Given that the climax of Raiders of the Lost Ark famously concludes with three men having their heads caved in, melted away and blown to pieces by a vengeful god, the film was originally given an R rating by the MPAA, much to the displeasure of the filmmakers. In order to somewhat lessen the visual impact of seeing up close someone's head erupt with the awesome power of the Lord, flames were added in front of Belloc's face to obscure the gore, leading to a more family-friendly PG rating. Number 35. Upon release, Raiders of the Lost Ark was welcomed with near-universal acclaim, with praise directed particularly at the film's thrilling action sequences and sly sense of humour. Raiders of the Lost Ark was nominated for nine Academy Awards, of which it won four, and has since appeared in numerous Best Movie lists, including being voted number two on Empire Magazine's 500 Greatest Movies of All Time in September of 2008. The film was also included among the 1001 Movies You Must See Before You Die, edited by Stephen Schneider, and was added to Roger Ebert's Great Movies list. Number 36. In 1999, Raiders of the Lost Ark was added to the National Film Registry by the United States Library of Congress, making it the only film from the Indiana Jones franchise to be inducted. Films are chosen for the registry for being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant, and Raiders of the Lost Ark has all three in spades. Number 37. Not only a critical success, Raiders of the Lost Ark was also 1981's biggest grossing film by a significant margin, raking in over $212 million in the United States alone, and almost $390 million worldwide. The next most lucrative film domestically of 1981 was the American drama On Golden Pond, directed by Mark Rydell. Me neither, which only managed to make a measly $199 million. <laughs> How embarrassing. Number 38. Following the wild success of Raiders of the Lost Ark, the series continued in 1984 with Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, set a year prior to the event of the first film, in which Jones finds himself in India, attempting to thwart an evil cult who have stolen a mystical stone and kidnapped a large number of children from the local village. 
The tone of this film is far darker than Raiders of the Lost Ark, which Spielberg and Lucas attribute to the fact that they were each going through pretty significant breakups at the time. Yeah, that'll do it. Number 39. The film's original title was Indiana Jones and the Temple of Death, which was changed because it sounded too foreboding, whereas the Temple of Doom conjures up nothing but pleasant and charming imagery, right guys? <laughs> Regardless, the word death was retained in the film's German title, Indiana Jones und der Temple der Todes. But which do you prefer? Do you think Temple of Doom was the right choice, or does Temple of Death have a nice ring to it? Let us know in our fancy YouTube poll. Number 40. Since making it, Steven Spielberg has stated that Temple of Doom is his least favourite in the Indiana Jones canon, stating it's too dark and too subterranean. On the bright side though, making the film did allow him to meet Kate Capshaw, who played Willie Scott, an American nightclub singer in the film who ends up tagging along on his dangerous anti-cult crusade. Years after making the film, Spielberg and Capshaw got hitched, and they've been happily married ever since. Number 41. Jones is accompanied in the film by an 11-year-old Chinese boy curiously named Short Round, who is played by Vietnamese-American actor Jonathan Le Quan in his film debut. Quan was selected for the role as part of a casting call in Los Angeles, though he originally attended only to provide moral support to his brother, not to audition. However, he caught the attention of the film's casting director by spending the entire time he was there telling his brother what to do. Spielberg liked his personality and eventually gave the role to Quan over about 6,000 other auditions. The Meaning of life. The dress that Scott wears in the Shanghai nightclub at the very start of the film was made completely of original beads from the 1920s and 30s, of which there was only enough to decorate a single garment. In an unscripted moment where the dress was left out to dry on a tree branch in the jungle, an elephant actually began to eat the ornately designed dress, requiring emergency repairs. Still, the damage was significant enough that costume designer Anthony Powell had to fill out the insurance forms, upon which he succinctly summed up the reason for the claim with the line, dress eaten by elephant. Number 43. Incidentally, the nightclub in which Scott is performing at the start of the film is called Club Obi-Wan, which is a reference I really shouldn't have to explain, so I won't. Moving on. So long, eh, Bowser? Number 44. As Indiana and his sidekicks arrive at the airport while making their escape from Shanghai, they are escorted to their plane by a man with a plummy English accent who introduces himself as Art Webber. This briefly seen character is in fact played by the one and only Dan Aykroyd, the near legendary American actor and comedian known for his time as a cast member on Saturday Night Live. Number 45. Steven Spielberg and George Lucas make cameo appearances handling luggage in the background of the airport scene. This is a reference to Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, who are both successful filmmakers involved in the Indiana Jones series. Number 46. Part of the sound effects heard as the engines run out of fuel on the plane is the same failing sound effect heard when the hyperdrive on Han Solo's Millennium Falcon fails in The Empire Strikes Back. If this fact sounds familiar, it's because Spielberg used the same sound effect when Jock Lindsay was starting up his seaplane in Raiders of the Lost Ark, which we told you about earlier in the video. Yep, Spielberg put the same sound effect in both films. Wow, he must really get a chuckle out of all his references. Number 47. Sri Lankan actor D.R. Nanayokara, who played the Indian village shaman in the film, did not speak a word of English, and had to learn his lines phonetically. The characteristic pauses in the dialogue were not there for dramatic effect, he was simply mimicking Steven Spielberg, who was prompting him off camera. Number 48. The chilled monkey brains that are served to the gang at Pankot Palace were actually made from custard and raspberry sauce, which is, very importantly, not monkey brains. Number 49. Shortly after Indy finds the secret passageway from his room in the palace, he and Short Round make their way through an insect-infested tunnel before getting themselves trapped in a spike-filled chamber with a slowly lowering ceiling. Mondays, am I right? Willie then has to rescue them, and in doing so gets absolutely covered in numerous creepy crawlies. In order to shoot the scene, Capsule had to take a Valium to calm her nerves, before getting up close and personal with thousands of cockroaches, beetles, centipedes and stick insects. Number 50. The Temple of Doom originally featured a scene involving Kate Capshaw and a large snake, which was to wrap around her while Willy bathed in a river. The scene was eventually cut from the film as Capshaw was too freaked out by the four and a half metre python, which had been brought specifically from England for the film. Steven Spielberg has since joked that the only reason Kate married him later on was because he allowed the scene to be cut. Number 51. A pair of snakes, though, did have to be flown into Sri Lanka for the scene in the film where Willy mistakes a dangling serpent for an elephant's trunk. The snakes were booked into their very own hotel rooms by their handler, Michael Culling, who made their reservations under the names Mr. and Mrs. Longfellow. <laughs> That's delightful, really. It's delightful. Number 52. 
In the scene in which Willy is about to be sacrificed by the cult members, the sound of the lightsaber being turned on can be heard when the stone doors of the lava bit are open. Constituting yet another Star Wars reference. Why not switch it up for once, guys? Reference something else, like, I don't know, my, my perennial flower of grace and beauty, Jennifer Lawrence. She's always worth a mention. Number 53. The large cult member who Jones fights while being tortured with a voodoo doll is played by Pat Roach, who you'll also remember played the Sherpa and German mechanic in Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> Starting to notice a pattern here. Number 54. When the gang are escaping in the minecart, Short Round is heard telling Indy to take the left tunnel, which is lit with blue light. Though Indy takes the right tunnel, which is lit with an ominous red colour. This is not a somehow temporally impossible reference to the Matrix, but rather mimics the blue and red lightsaber colours respectively used by the goodies and baddies in Star Wars. Further enforced by the fact that the blue tunnel is safe and the red tunnel is not. Number 55. The name of the young Maharajas in the film is Zalim Singh, as mentioned by his devious Prime Minister, Chatar Lal. The word Zalim means cruel or evil in Hindi and various other subcontinental languages. Number 56. Along with the 1984 film Gremlins, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom is widely known for being the impetus of the creation of the PG-13 rating by the MPAA, as many people felt that both movies were too violent for a PG rating, but not quite violent enough for an R rating. Still, the Temple of Doom was eventually given the PG rating, as the PG-13 designation was not introduced until two months after the film's release. Number 57. The third Indiana Jones film was released in 1989 under the auspicious title of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, which Spielberg himself has stated as his favourite in the series. Set two years after the events of Raiders of the Lost Ark, the film follows Jones in his attempt to locate his estranged father, played brilliantly by Sean Connery, who has gone missing while searching for the Holy Grail. And guess who else is looking for the Grail too? Yep, that's right, bad guys. Number 58. When Spielberg and Lucas were throwing ideas around for the third film, Lucas initially wanted to have it set in a haunted mansion. But this suggestion was soon rejected as Spielberg had just finished making the 1982 horror film Poltergeist. Lucas then came up with the idea for the search for the Holy Grail, which the naysaying Spielberg also initially didn't like, believing it to be too esoteric. Eventually, however, Spielberg suggested introducing Indiana's father, and the script finally began to coalesce. Number 59. At one point, the British playwright Tom Stoppard was paid $120,000 to do a rewrite of the script, and apparently he earned his keep, because he polished up much of the dialogue and made a lot of changes. After the film was released and met with substantial success, he was paid a further million dollars as a bonus. Spielberg has even stated that Stoppard was pretty much responsible for every line of dialogue. Number 60. Sean Connery was born on the 25th of August 1930, while Harrison Ford was born on the 13th of July 1942, meaning that the pair play father and son despite the fact that Connery is 12 years older than Ford. Number 61. At the beginning of the film, when Jones is teaching his class, he tells his students, if it's the truth you're interested in, Dr. Tyree's philosophy class is right down the hall. This is actually a personal reference on the part of Ford, who studied philosophy at Ripon College in Wisconsin under a professor named Dr. William E. Tyree. Number 62. When filming the book burning scene at the huge rally in Berlin, Spielberg apparently made all the extras performing the salute put their other arms behind their backs and cross their fingers, which we all know entirely voids racist gestures. Number 63. Number 63. The uniforms worn by the bad guys in Berlin look some authentic because most of them actually are. The film's costume designer Anthony Powell, with his co-designer Joanna Johnston, managed to find and obtain a bunch of genuine uniforms to be used in The Last Crusade. Nintendo 64. The scene in which Jones and his father are dining on the blimp was actually meant to take place in winter, but it was filmed in summer. In order to prevent themselves from overheating, both Connery and Ford opted not to wear trousers during the filming of the entire sequence. Number 65. When shooting in Venice, the production of The Last Crusade were granted complete control of the Grand Canal for six whole hours between 7am and 1pm on one day. That's a big deal, considering canals are basically Venice's whole thing. Number 66. At one point during the scene in which Jones first meets Donovan and learns about his father's search for the Holy Grail, Donovan's wife comes into his study to politely tell him he's neglecting his guests, like that selfish little weasel he is. When she opens the doors, the Imperial March from Star Wars can be heard playing on the piano in the background, because if there's one thing the Indiana Jones series needs more of, it's Star Wars references. Number 67. The ubiquitous Pat Roach does appear in The Last Crusade, but only in a single shot of him running behind Vogel towards the Zeppelin. Roach was originally meant to appear in a scene in which Jones knocks him unconscious aboard the Zeppelin, extending the running joke of Jones fighting and prevailing against Roach's characters in every single film in the series. But this larger appearance was cut from the final movie. This turned out to be Roach's final performance in an Indiana Jones film though, as he sadly died in 2004. Number 68. 
The Last Crusade features the most chase sequences of any Indiana Jones movie, with a grand total of six different types of chases, specifically chases on foot, trains, boats, motorcycles, planes, and cars. This is also the only movie in the franchise to have a boat chase or train chase. You're basically spoilt for choice for chase sequences. Number 69. Why did it have to be snakes? In the scene in which Indy and his father try to escape in the Zeppelin, Indy throws Vogel out of a window, because Jones loves a good defenestration. Vogel, who is played by English actor Michael Byrne, lands safely on a pile of suitcases, one of which has a sticker on it that reads, Hotel Shone Grindelwald. By either sheer coincidence or some unfathomably specific twist of fate, Byrne appeared in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1 as the one and only Gellart Grindelwald. Spooky. Number 70. In the course of their search for the Holy Grail, those bad chaps employed the use of two Kubelwagens, a German military sedan that was actually used extensively by the Germans throughout World War II. However, the events of the Last Crusade take place in 1938, and the Kubelwagen was not designed and built until 1940. Did you think we wouldn't notice Spielberg? You make me sick. Number 71. The harrowing depiction of Donovan's death after drinking from the incorrect chalice and rapidly aging into little more than a dusty skeleton was dubbed Donovan's Destruction by the Wizards at Industrial Light and Magic, the visual effects division of Lucasfilm Limited. The creation of this scene marked a technological breakthrough in effects, constituting the first shots completely computer composited and then scanned into a film. Number 72. In order to create the effect of the miraculous healing of Henry's bullet wound, baking soda was applied to Sean Connery's torso, producing a foaming effect when it came into contact with the water from the Holy Grail, which was actually vinegar. Yep, sometimes special effects are just as special as the paper mache volcanoes you made in school. Number 73. Indeed, one of the sound effects used when the temple begins to break apart at the climax of the film is just a recording of someone rubbing a balloon. We're learning a lot about Foley sound, aren't we, this time? Number 74. The four horses upon which Brody, Salah, Jones and his father leave the temple in the final scenes of the film on were loaned to the movie personally by King Hussein of Jordan. What a nice guy. Number 75. It's worth noting at this point that the Indiana Jones franchise did not stay confined solely to movies, and expanded to television in 1992 with the release of the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. As the title suggests, the series featured various thrilling adventures of Indiana Jones in his youth. But despite a warm reception from critics and multiple Emmy Award wins, the series was cancelled after only two seasons due to its hefty budget and low ratings, though four made-for-TV movies based on the series were later produced between 1994 and 1996. Number 76. Between 1983 and 1986, Marvel Comics published an Indiana Jones comic book series entitled The Further Adventures of Indiana Jones, which was re-released by Dark Horse Comics between 2009 and 2010. Various novelizations of the films and original Indiana Jones novels have also been published, just in case you're a die-hard indie fan whose voracious appetite for tales about a sexy whip-wielding archaeologist cannot be sated by film and TV alone. Number 77. Numerous Indiana Jones video games have also been released too, starting with the Raiders of the Lost Ark game released in 1982. Since then, Indiana Jones games have been released for a range of different platforms, including the NES, SNES, PC, Macintosh, Sega Game Gear, Nintendo 64, Game Boy Color, PlayStation 1, 2, and 3, PSP, Xbox, Xbox 360, the Wii, mobile phones, and Facebook. Number 78. In 2008, a full 19 years after the release of The Last Crusade, Indiana Jones returned to the big screen in Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Set in 1957, the film follows Jones in a race to find a telepathic crystal skull, which the Soviets wished to use to gain the upper hand in the Cold War. With a final budget of roughly 185 million, this film is, by a considerable margin, the most expensive movie directed by Steven Spielberg. Number 79. In order to keep the movie a secret, during filming it was referred to as the Genre Project, which sounds like an obvious fake name to me, but what do I know? I'm just an intangible online personality chucking facts at you for internet points. Number 80. Kate Blanchett trained in fencing to prepare for her role in the film, and during filming practiced karate. She modeled her performance as the stern Soviet military scientist Irina Spolko on Rosa Klepp from the 1963 Bond film From Russia With Love, who also had an imposing manner and intimidating yet stylish bob cut. Number 81. Paramount's executives originally wanted Indy's trademark whip to be CGI owing to new safety rules, a suggestion declared ridiculous by Ford, who was adamant that he would wield his weapon for wheelsies. Wheelsies. I mean, not wheelsies. Lots of W's there. Number 82. Ford refused to dye his hair for the role as well, and convinced screenwriter David Kep to include more jokes and references regarding Indy's age, believing they would help to combat America's paranoia about aging. I couldn't agree more. Ford was in his mid-60s when he filmed The Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and he's still a looker. Number 83. 
Ford had kept himself in such good shape throughout the 19 years that had elapsed between the last crusade and Kingdom of the Crystal Skull that his costume measurements had barely changed between the filming of the two films. Ford also performed many of his own stunts for the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, in part because stunt work had become far safer since the late 80s, and in part because he's a total badass. Number 84. The girl who punches Williams in the diner scene is none other than Sasha Spielberg, daughter of director Steven Spielberg and Kate Capshaw. Not nepotism though, definitely not. Number 85. Not only that, but one of the students in the library is played by Chet Hanks, the son of frequent Spielberg collaborator Tom Hanks. Still not nepotism, nope. Chet Hanks was fated to play student in library regardless of his parentage. Number 86. So far, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is the only installment in the Indiana Jones film series in which Jones does not fire his gun, apparently becoming a bit more of a pacifist in his later years. Not too much of a pacifist though, he's still the world's most violent archaeologist by quite some margin. Number 87. Understandably, security was extremely tight throughout production in order to prevent leaks about the film. One of the ways in which the movie makers sought to keep everything a secret was to utilise false cast names in daily call sheets. For example, Kate Blanchett was Mean Girl, Karen Allen was The Damsel, and Harrison Ford was referred to on paper simply by the number symbol, more commonly referred to these days by millennial scum such as myself as a hashtag. Number 88. During the motorcycle chase, just as Indiana and Mutt enter the library from an exterior shot, a student can be seen wearing an outfit that looks eerily similar to the classic Indiana Jones costume complete with tan pants, a leather jacket, and a trademark fedora. Spooky, right? <laughs> nah, wrong. Filmmakers are just narcissists. Everyone knows that. Number 89. When running away from the Russian tent camp, Jones says, This is intolerable. A quirky little quip originally spoken by Henry Jones Sr. in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. This is intolerable! Number 90. Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is the only movie in the Indiana Jones saga in which Jones doesn't visit Asia. Jones visited Nepal in Raiders of the Lost Ark, China and India in Temple of Doom, and Hattay in Turkey in The Last Crusade. In fact, Crystal Skull is the only film in the series that's entirely set within the Western Hemisphere. Number 91. In the scene at the end of the film in which Indiana and Marion get hitched, the music playing in the background is Leia's theme from... Star Wars. Number 92. Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is sadly the only Indiana Jones movie not to receive any Oscar nominations. Because it's not very good. I'm sure this is a sore spot for Spielberg, so for the sake of our buddy Steven, who's definitely watching the video, let's just move on from that, shall we? Number 93. This movie was delivered to theatres with a combination lock, for which the correct combination was not provided until the first day of screening. Code names for the movie included Turbo and Bandwagon. Number 94. At the 2010 Cannes Film Festival, Shia LaBeouf criticised this performance in The Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, stating that he felt like he dropped the ball on the Indiana Jones legacy. He also implicated Ford in his criticism of the film, prompting the veteran actor to refer to LaBeouf as an effing idiot, and when asked whether such statements may sour his relationship with Steven Spielberg, added, He needs to hear this, but that I talk to him often enough to know that I'm not out of line. <laughs> Plot twist there, he was wrong. Number 95. Still, it appears as though LaBeouf wasn't alone in his awareness that the film takes some strange turns. Both Spielberg and Lucas tried to take blame for the infamous moment in which Jones survived a nuclear blast by taking cover inside a fridge. When asked about it, Spielberg replied, Blame me, don't blame George, that was my silly idea. A claim refuted by Lucas who said the idea was his own and that Spielberg was merely protecting him. <laughs> Whoever it was, lads, it was bloody stupid. Number 96. One of the trademarks of the franchise is to begin with a shot of something mountain-shaped reminiscent of the Paramount Pictures logo. Specifically, the Raiders of the Lost Ark and the Last Crusade open with actual rock formations, whereas the Temple of Doom begins with a shot of a large gong decorated with an image of a mountain. Crystal Skull, though, starts with a shot of a small mound of dirt produced by a squeaky little prairie dog. That doesn't say something about the film, I don't know what does. <coughs> Number 97. Another Indiana Jones tradition is the widely used cinematic in-joke known as the Wilhelm Scream. Oh! An omnipresent sound effect used at least once in every installment of the series so far, and indeed every film ever it seems. The inescapable scream is heard in Raiders of the Lost Ark when a German soldier falls out the back of a truck. <coughs> Several times in the Temple of Doom, such as when Mola Ram is eaten alive by the alligators. As the result of a grenade blast in the desert gunfight scene in The Last Crusade. <coughs> and when Williams and Indiana almost run over a student while riding a motorbike through the library in the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Number 98. 
Over 30 bull whips have been used throughout filming of the entire Indiana Jones series. These range in length from 6 feet to 16 feet. A range in badassery from pretty badass to extremely badass indeed if I may say so myself. Number 99. Of course, we're all eagerly awaiting the arrival of the as yet untitled fifth film in the Indiana Jones series, professionally known as Indy 5. After years of rumours and speculation, the film was officially announced in 2016, with a release date of July 19th, 2019, although that's been pushed back to July of 2021, reportedly due to script issues. The upside is that the film's release in 2021 will mark 40 years of the Indiana Jones franchise, an achievement of which I'm sure the sandcastle building Lucas and Spielberg would no doubt be proud. Number 100. Yeah. At various points, absurd rumours arose suggesting that modern day heartthrobs like Chris Pratt, Robert Patterson, and Bradley Cooper may assume the lead role in the fifth Indiana Jones film. Any such nonsense has been dismissed with the confirmation that Harrison Ford would be reprising his role as Indiana Jones because the role belongs to him and only him. Number 101. Owing to the fact that the previous movie synced up the timeline of Indiana Jones with Harrison Ford's age, it would not be entirely unreasonable to suggest that the fifth installment in the series may take place somewhere in the 60s. This has since been confirmed by Spielberg, who stated that the film would be set in the swinging 60s during its appearance on the Empire Magazine podcast in March of 2018. So that was 101 facts about Indiana Jones. Which is your favourite instalment in the franchise? Which is your favourite whip? Let me know in the comments down below. Be sure to give this video a like because it really does help us out more than a map does when Indiana's looking for his treasure. <laughs> uh. Also, subscribe to 101 Facts if you haven't done so already, please. We've got a spot here waiting just for you. Come on, come on by. In the meantime, though, look at these two videos on screen. They're especially served up on a plate just for you. Tuck in and I'll see you there. A river dirt.